Well, stop me if you've heard this before. The FDA is fast-tracking new emergency COVID shots that will be made by Pfizer and Moderna. And we just learned that trucks are being prepared right now to send monkeypox vaccines around the United States. And RFK Jr. could be about to crack some heads in Washington, D.C. if President Trump does, in fact, put him in charge of making America healthy again. So get ready, folks. Cheryl Atkinson is the award-winning investigative journalist and author of the brand new book, which comes out on Tuesday. And the new book is called Follow the Science, How Big Pharma Misleads, Obscures, and Prevails. And Cheryl is a guest on our show. Cheryl, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Your book title suggests that Big Pharma is obscuring the truth. I don't know about at every turn, but it seems that way to us. What are some of the most egregious examples uh, that you uncovered in your work as part of this new book? You don't have to give them all away, but what jumped out to you that just had your jaw sort of hitting the floor? Well, I've known about a lot of this. I just try to compile things that might that most people didn't know about, and one of them is... Uh, but most people don't know that the most popular textbook that our doctors are taught from in med school or refer to is called the Merck Manuals. It's published by the pharmaceutical company Merck, believe it or not. And Merck <laughs> Pinky promises that it's, yeah, Mink Perky Pinky promises that its editorial division is separate from its corporate pharmaceutical division, which has been, as you may know, fined billions of dollars for to settle criminal charges and all kinds of penalties over the years for bribing doctors, misleading people, and so on, you know, marketing dangerous drugs. But we're to believe this book tells the truth to doctors. And I think this explains a lot as to why our doctors treat us the way we do as we're getting sicker and sicker as a society and they're pretending not to notice. I dig into the Merck manuals and I show not only shocking omissions in what they're taught, but also just blatantly false information that they're taught about medicine and other things. Do you think the biopharmaceutical complex should be fearful of President Trump becoming president once again? And if he sticks to what he said he was going to do, which was put Robert F. Kennedy Jr. in charge of, quote, making America healthy again, should the bio, should the biopharmaceutical industry be quivering in its boots? They are, you know, and I've quipped that I hope both Trump and Kennedy have food tasters at this point because they pose a uniquely dangerous threat to this establishment that includes not just big pharma, it includes the media, our political figures, and it includes the medical establishment that we saw uh, strong arming us and putting out so much misinformation during COVID. Kennedy told me when he was running for president, and I believe this is true, he's one of the most well-informed political figures, maybe the biggest most well-informed political figures on the national stage on these topics. He says, I know exactly who to go into and fire at CDC headquarters in Atlanta by name when he's talking about corruption that he believes exists at CDC. Remember, he's a lawyer. He's litigated against the government as they have defended vaccine companies, which is shockingly their role in our court system. The government Department of Justice defends vaccine makers when children are injured or people are injured by vaccines. Kennedy has won cases that have gone after corruption and injuries. Um, When he's talking about the government, he knows it inside and out. Do you think, well, you know, President Trump, of course, was in charge of Operation Warp Speed. He's repeatedly talked about it and sort of praised it. Do Do you think that he was blindsided, boondoggled by the biopharmaceutical complex, the individuals who are in the CDC and others who are surrounding President Trump misled? I know a lot of conservatives will say, Look, he was the good guy in all of this. He was just misled by all of these all of these people around him. Do you think things would be different this time if he's got RFK there sort of in, fr- in you know in the front of the store, work in the kitchen, so to speak? There's no doubt there would be differences. President Trump already has seen in a look back some of the mistakes that he made based on the advice of people who were not advising him well. There's a little piece in the book where I talk about meeting secretly with a really fascinating White House medical advisor. This guy's top in his field. And he described to me at the height of COVID as we met in a closed sports car that he owned in the middle of a restaurant parking lot that was closed during COVID. He was lamenting how he was trying to, he and others, 
have President Trump's ear on some of these issues, on things that proved to be correct in the long term, but how he and others were fighting that Fauci juggernaut and how difficult it was to break through. And I've tried to imagine, if you're Donald Trump and you're surrounded by people who don't necessarily have your best interests at heart, which was the case when he was president, and also are conflicted by the pharma biomedical complex, what do you know to believe? And I also think if the president, think about this, Clayton, if he had chosen not to shut down, there still would have been a lot of deaths, and he would have been blamed for not shutting down. He did shut down, and it was still a disaster, but at least he followed the recommendations of the Fauciites and, and all the people advising him to do it. I think if he hadn't shut down and we would have had many deaths, the people that don't support him would have said, look, he made a mistake and he killed all of these people. He was in a really tough spot. Absolutely. I don't wish it on anyone to be in that situation. But there, of course, we now know in hindsight, there were countries, of course, like Sweden. And we know the Amish population in the United States. You're reporting on the Amish population. You just have some updates there that I want to share with our audience. But we've repeatedly covered on the show. I, mean, I grew up in Amish country, not you know, in Pennsylvania, near Lancaster County and so forth. So uh, I understood, uh, you know, I understood that community well. And I knew that they, you know, they didn't shut down. Certainly no vaccines. Well, you know, at their church services, they were sharing wine. Uh, everyone would come together. There was no sort of panic and shutdown and, and separation of individuals. So, But there was quite a bit of media disinformation about the Amish population in the United States. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, yes. After Associated Press and others reported early on that they may have reached herd immunity and been the first to do so because they didn't shut down, they let COVID spread throughout their population, I reported on that, and there was a huge effort, in my view, on the part of the government pharma complex to try to, as they always do, disparage the Amish approach so that people don't think that's a good idea. As part of this, a federally funded study came out that was intended to throw cold water and imply, if you read the title, that somehow the Amish suffered far more deaths and this was so dangerous because of their religious beliefs. Not true. And when I dug into the study, the data didn't show it. They, in my view, manipulated the data and the sample that they used. So I, as I've done with other studies, I, first of all, I try to get the information communications, who's behind the study, who did the government fund this propaganda in order to do what I think they tried to do. But of course, you can't get, the government just ignores your FOIA request. They don't give that information. But I challenged this study in a very factual way with the scientific journal that published it, and it took a year but I just found out in the last couple of days, the journal notified me they've issued multiple corrections to this bad study to try to correct some of the things that I raised. It still doesn't, they didn't change the title. If people just look at it, they may think it proves that the Amish fared worse somehow, but it does not. And as I told when I challenged the study, as I told the journal editors, the takeaway, even from your skewed data, is that the Amish fared no worse for not having shut down or used vaccines or gone to the hospital, which proves their approach was better. They made more money as a society than they'd ever made the year they didn't shut down. So could we have done the same thing and not devastated our schools and our economy? It implies yes. And that's the takeaway that they don't focus on in this bad study. Yeah, again, I always come back to Sweden, right? Uh, and think about how devastating it was for our children um, how devastating it was for commerce, our society. Um, and I think, you know, there's a lot of looking back now to say, well, these, these, students, these students didn't suffer in the way that American students did, being set back years because of lockdowns and being kept out of school, right, when you look at the data internationally. Yeah, that's true. And then so if you expand that, I wanted to look at more broadly in the, with COVID more in the rearview mirror, our health overall, people have started looking at government recommendations on other things. Our food supply, the toxic chemicals the government practically forces us to ingest by making healthy food unavailable to us by the rules and policies that they have that are dictated by chemical companies and pharmaceutical companies. This is a national crisis. I, I wholeheartedly agree with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. when he says the things that he says about our chronic disorders, ballooning, as our doctors and our federal health agencies either pretend not to notice 
or don't notice. I think that's the biggest scandal. Can't they see how sick our young people and older people too, but how sick our young people have become in the span of a generation or two? It's not normal. And instead of figuring out the root origin, they try to normalize it and say, let's treat it. It's all good. Don't criticize it. Don't look at root causes. Because I think too often the root causes lead to hormone disruptors and endocrine disruptors that are known to be in our food and in our water and in our medicine that can be causing a lot of the disorders that we're seeing today. It's, it's absolutely tragic. You mentioned the role of media. We talked a little bit about media shaping public perception. How complicit is the media in spreading Big Pharma's narrative? I mean, we've shown multiple times on our show the clip, you know, Anderson Cooper 360 brought to you by Pfizer and all of these different segments on the Today Show and everything else brought to you by Moderna, brought to you by Pfizer. So how how complicit is the media in spreading these lies and obscuring the truth? Well, as an investigative reporter for CBS, I felt like at the time, talking about the early 2000s, I was sort of on the leading edge of experiencing the growing pharmaceutical influence in our editorial content. Media is key. At least we used to be a watchdog. If, if the government wasn't going to do its job, if Big Pharma was going to overreach, we were supposed to be sort of an independent voice that could come in and hold them accountable. And that was largely done through 2000, 2001, 2002. But as the pharmaceutical industry came to become ubiquitous with their TV ads, didn't used to be legal in this country, pharmaceutical advertising on TV, as we developed this partnership that makes the media millions and billions of dollars and makes the pharmaceutical industry so much money, it was sort of a deal with the devil. The media quit reporting on these things. First of all, the industry was heavy handed trying to censor the stuff successfully in many cases, in my experience. But now they don't even have to try to censor because the reporters self-censor. They understand where their bread is buttered. They understand what stories are going to make it on TV or make headlines. So it's huge that that watchdog that role that the media used to play, we now just go along with everybody else. We're part of that complex. It's, that's frightening. I think you bring up a great point, the idea of self-censoring. There's the fear. You're seeing it, whether it's covering the war, you know, covering the war in Ukraine, uh, from conservative media covering the war in Gaza. There's that self-censorship. They know what attacks would come their way if they open their mouth and tell the truth on any of it. Uh, it's really, really troubling. You know, you titled your book, Follow the Science. We've joked here on the show about Dr. Fauci calling himself science. He says, I am the science. <laughs> why did you choose no. Why did you choose to title the book, Follow the Science? I mean, it seems like that has been thrown out following the science. They've, science has become, has taken a back seat. Well, that was Harper Collins' choice, picking the title. And I, I tend to agree. I think it's tongue in cheek. It's the fact that those who said they were following the science were doing the opposite. It's the fact that we abandoned the scientific mission of following the science. I said at the very beginning of the book, the little quotation you put at the front, no legitimate science ever said the science is settled. These are phrases that propagandists have put out to try to convince us not to look where we want to look. And remember when they're censoring information, it's not because they really want to keep us from learning misinformation or disinformation, quite the opposite. They're afraid we'll learn the truth. And that's proven time and again when you see what they are censoring. They don't want a fair recitation of all information that's out there. They only want you to hear their propaganda or their narrative and not consider the science that may run counter to what they're trying to claim. How does Big Pharma use fear and uncertainty um, particularly during health crises right now to sort of push their products and maybe even obscure, as you write in the title of your book, obscure the truth about what's happening. And I think in many ways, maybe we're seeing it right now with monkeypox. There's all this fear about it. World Health Organization has declared it, you know, a major emer health emergency. And yet when you start to dig into the truth, it doesn't seem like it's that scary, if I'm not mistaken. But you, you run with it, Cheryl. I think some of the best advice I got, and I considered it to be more of a quip than serious at the time that I heard it, but now I really take it to heart. I had government scientists say to me, when the government says you need to worry about a health thing, you probably needn't worry. And when they say you don't need to worry, you should worry. And I hate to wow. say it, but time and again when I've covered 
scandals and corruption and health matters, that's proven to be the case. There was an outbreak, fairly wide outbreak of a terrible, it's called EV68, I can't remember the name of it, it's sort of a cold-like virus that was paralyzing children. It's a polio-like virus that you probably didn't hear about. I was trying to cover at length. I had to sue the FDA and CDC to get the basic information about something they didn't want people to hear about. These cases were spreading in all states. Doctors were worried about it. They were seeing these kids in hospitals. They were trying to connect the dots, saying this is how the polio outbreak originally started with spikes in wintertime. Huge story. Not only would CDC not talk about it, they wouldn't even give a, so I could make a map, where the cases were occurring. You know, they cite privacy concerns, although that wouldn't have invaded anybody's privacy, when they don't want you to know about something because there's no vaccine to peddle for them to peddle. They hide it. They won't even tell you what states and where these cases are occurring. But you saw how it was when they wanted to scare everybody about COVID, these maps and these extensive, you know, red blaring incidence cases and numbers and data. So when they want you to be scared, They'll put out anything, private or not, about patients and about information when they don't want you to know about something. I'll give one more quick example. Swine flu, which I covered at CBS News, we had that swine flu epidemic some years ago. Well, guess what, Clayton? There was no epidemic. And I found that out by two sources in the government told me at the time that the government had ordered or told states to quit counting and testing for swine flu at the height of the supposed epidemic. And the scientists said to me, they're either trying to overcount or undercount, and your job is to find out which. So I FOIA'd all 50 states, because CDC wouldn't give me the data, to get the number of the tests that were showing up positive for swine flu among their most likely patients. They have a way to say, this patient's sick, and he'd been to Mexico, which is a risk factor. We'll send that to a lab. Nearly 100% of those should have tested positive for swine flu if we had an epidemic like they claimed almost none were swine flu. And I only learned that by, again, forcing the data out of all 50 states. There was virtually no swine flu in circulation when the government was claiming there was an epidemic and they were developing an emergency vaccine. Again, they were saying to worry when there was no reason to worry. So sadly, I think maybe it's not true every time, but when they say to worry or they overblow something, maybe you don't need to. And when they say not to worry, maybe you ought to pay attention. It kind of reminds me of the border crisis in the United States and terrorism abroad, right? We had the, the color-coded terrorism chart under Tom Ridge at the uh, Department of Homeland Security at the time, right? The red-green alert system. You need to be worried about terrorism. Every day when you're going to work, you need to be worried about terrorism. And we have a wide-open southern border, millions of you know, illegal gang right. members pouring across the border, and we're not told anything. But don't worry about it at all. Don't even, but you need to worry about Iran. You absolutely need to worry about Iran and Houthi rebels that may come attack you uh, in America. It's amazing how they they push these types of narratives, isn't it? And the Russians, you know, I'm not saying the Russians oh, yeah. are right in the things they've done, but in traveling, and I just got back from a trip to Poland. I was with the NATO forces during live fire exercises. I've tried to cover these. Obviously, in Europe, they're very fearful of Russia, but. Every time I talk to the NATO people, listen, they say if Russia were trying to expand outside of Ukraine, we would have weeks and weeks of a heads up because things, as we monitor them, they would have to move equipment and do certain things. And from the start, the NATO officials, when I ask, have said they're not even this close to doing something like that. So every time right. I hear this, the Russians are about to invade Europe. We better give more money to Ukraine or else I'm thinking. They've never, according to NATO, and NATO is definitely for, you know, pro-defense and so on, they've never even started to make a move that concerns NATO even slightly, the, the officials who are watching. But we're, you know, put on pins and needles like this is imminent. Right. I mean, and overnight, the Polish, you know, over the past 24 hours, the Polish government is done sending weapons to Ukraine. And the front page of the Polish newspapers today call it the Ukrainization of Poland with the millions of uh, Ukraine refugees in the country, they've, they're fed up. I mean, they're absolutely fed up with what's happened in their country. So but to get that kind of truth, you won't see it in the mainstream media at all. Of course, you'll get Look, this sort of If you don't mind, on, on, that topic, on that topic, my 10th season of my TV program starts a week from this Sunday on September 8th, the new season. And the first thing I'm covering, because I just got back from Europe, their illegal immigration crisis is arguably worse than ours. If you Google this, as I did before my trip, it doesn't exist. 
The only thing that exists in Europe, according to Google, is Islamophobic people that are complaining about Muslims moving to Europe. The truth is, it's a crisis that both left and right have now resolved to try to handle. The left understands that the people in general are fed up with this. They have had people coming over on boats, people coming over on horrible rafts from Turkey, from mostly Muslim nations. They can't absorb the economic damage. They have had terrorist attacks. They have stabbings. It, it then, in turn, does generate anti-Muslim feelings. There are people living side by side in countries like Denmark and Sweden, where they're burning the Bible, meaning the new Muslim newcomers, and then some of the Christian hardliners are burning the Koran. This is huge over there, and that's going to be—it's not unlike our crisis, and like I said, arguably worse. But you don't hear about it. No, I think you're right to say it's worse. Uh, absolutely. We've been trying to beat that drum here on the show to point out what's coming to the United States. All you need to do is walk down the streets of Lisbon to see what was once one of the most peaceful countries in the world, the third most peaceful country in the world, to see what illegal immigration has done to the Iberian Peninsula all through France. I mean, I'll go into go into Kashkaish up north of Lisbon and you'll see what happens there. I mean, it's it's been a disaster with some of these gangs, of course, and the, the robberies and the crime that has been spiking, but they're keeping it quiet. And if you watch European news, it's absolute propaganda, absolute propaganda um, and arguably, as you point out, even worse than here in the United States. So thank you for your amazing work on that. Um, we need more voices like you uncovering the truth. So make sure people tune into that. But back to your book here. I'll get you out of here on this, Cheryl. You know, there's a lot of these pharmaceutical companies have massive lobbying operation and arguably bigger. I think if, if I'm not mistaken, you can correct me if I'm wrong, bigger than the military industrial complex in the United States, the biopharmaceutical complex, as our friend Dr. Peter McCullough and others like to call it, is arguably bigger, more massive. And can you talk about some of how the, this influence and lobbying influence is really swaying public policy and, of course, legislation as it runs through Congress? Well, let me give you an idea. And I don't know which is bigger. I've never tried to measure it. You may be right. But Understand this relationship. Congress, there are good members of both parties that would like to do something about this, but they are run by what I call an extra constitutional system that's set, been set up by the Democrat and Republican Party, where the party leaders are calling the shots on so many things, which members get on important congressional committees, from which they can raise the money to get reelected, which is job one. And if you understand the relationship, it's been this way for at least 20 years and maybe longer to some degree. The committees that are supposed to do oversight on, let's say, the defense contractors that you mentioned or the pharmaceutical industry, those committees now work for those industries because that's who they're raising money from to get reelected. That's how they got positions from their party to be on that committee. So the committees that should be doing the work that you and I would like to see done, these committees in Congress, and write the laws or do the legislation that they should do, instead they're taking their cues from the people they're supposed to regulate. The pharmaceutical industry and their lobbyists write the bills that we, that we, the resulting bills that become laws, and they put things in there that even the members of Congress probably don't understand. Little, as one lobbyist told me, a comma placed in the right place will benefit a certain industry that Congress doesn't even understand, but the lobbyists full well understand. The, the, defense, the defense committees in Congress and the intelligence committees are beholden to, because the members raise money from, the defense industry and defense contractors. So job one for these committees and the members on it is not to get to the bottom of this stuff. It's to make sure there aren't hearings on certain things because they've been given donations by these companies to serve their interests. They make sure that the laws that are written and passed benefit these companies who are contributing to them. It's not about us anymore. The committees now consider their stakeholders to be the corporations where they raise their money from cycle to cycle. Yeah, the title of your book is Follow the Science, How Big Pharma Misleads, Obscures, and Prevails. I'm a glass half full kind of person. I like to try to be positive. So to know that they're prevailing at a sort of every turn, but then you have great journalists like yourself who are getting the information out to the public. I mean, how can we fight back against this? How can we make sure that they're not prevailing? Is there, do you have sort of a prescription for us going forward into 2025 on how to handle this? I do. I'm glass half full as well. I point out that I think the audaciousness of this, this medical political complex 
during COVID created activists out of people that weren't really paying attention, and now they are, so that's good, and that there's many independent scientists and doctors who are mainstream, well-published, super well-respected, who've left mainstream medicine to try to pursue these questions we're discussing because they became so disgusted during COVID. That's a positive. But also, I'm urging people to take back control of their own health by getting good information. It's, unfortunately, it's not, it's not all that easy. There's a little research you're going to have to do, and I refer people to places they can look and how to do, use their critical thinking skills to break through the morass of the false information they're going to be barraged with online when they do searches and on the media, but how to think about things differently so that they can arrive at other information and good sources and find the truth in a very confusing information landscape. It is possible, and I've, I've referenced specific people and resources to look to, as well as some th active things people can do to change matters today, like reporting your own adverse events from medicine when your doctors aren't to the database that's supposed to collect them, possible adverse events. Reporting your own possible vaccine injuries because your doctor's not collecting them the way he's supposed to. There's a place you can go to, a federal database, that makes it harder for the government to ignore the patterns that are emerging. So there are things people can do to feel like they're doing something positive and taking back control of their family's health and their own health. And read your book, read your reporting, and watch your show. My guest has been Cheryl Atkinson. The book is called Follow the Science. You can pre-order it right now, so I encourage our audience to go. We love to support journalists and investigative journalists who are doing great work here on this show. So go and pre-order the book right now um, and dive deep into this. Uh, Cheryl, it's been a real treat having you here on the show. Thank you so much, and thanks for the great work. I appreciate it, Clayton. Thanks. Thanks to your listeners.